Brought to you by your local authorized Porsche dealer. an age when thousands around the world flocked to Nickelodeon parlors, theaters, and picture palaces to witness what was to them a new miracle. For this was the time of the birth of the cinema, the motion picture, the very beginning of the first truly mass entertainment industry. turn of the century, producers soon caught on to the public's love for the adventure film. For then, as today, moviegoers often cared very little for the world they already knew. And, well, for a few pennies or nickels or sous, they could be transported to the lands of intrepid heroes and beautiful, courageous heroines evil scoundrels and villains and so on. But in those days, merely going to a picture palace must have been something of an adventure in itself. Here, images of anything that moved seemed exciting, and audiences, for the most part, saw scenes of everyday life. These topical views, as they were called, filmed between 1895 and 1899, seemed a wonder then. You could take a ride on Paris's new overhead railway, spend a day at London's Hampstead Fair, or see the latest fad, a ladies' formation cycling team. No one much thought of making such images dramatic. Although there is talk of when audiences saw Louis Lumiere's shot of a train arriving at Nice Station, they fled from their seats for fear of being run down. Elsewhere, pioneering exhibitors linked sight and sound and brought the quivering-voiced matinee idol to the screen. But it was nearly all experiment and enterprise, with, apart from a few exceptions, precious little art. One exception, though, was this man, Edwin Porter. Porter worked for the amazing American inventor, Thomas Edison, and in 1902 directed Life of an American Fireman. Here, Porter staged a few scenes to provide a story and intercut these with several previously filmed images of local fire brigades. The overall result had great dramatic effect. For in this modest little movie, Porter creatively used cross-cutting, the film technique that condenses space, time, and drama. Even today, this juxtapositioning of images forms the base for all film storytelling.
Now the adventure film was truly underway. And the mingling of a dramatic story coupled with location filming formed the framework for many of the early efforts. In New York, the newly rising huge office blocks provide the backdrop for this film from the young biograph company titled Skyscrapers of New York. In this spectacular setting, a recently dismissed worker seeks retribution by attacking the foreman. All prior to the inevitable girder-clinging rescue. A few pioneers took note of new trends, and men like G.S. Smith, William Paul, Cecil Hepworth, and others began to put a beginning, middle, and end to their films. In 1905, Cecil Hepworth made Rescued by Rover. Here, an innovation, for in this adventure of a kidnapped child, the hero is Rover, a canine progenitor to Rin Tin Tin and Lassie. discovers the whereabouts of the child and brings father to where the girl is held captive by a drunken beggar woman. In those days, filmmaking was very much of a cottage industry and Hepworth features himself, wife and daughter as the leading players. And not forgetting Rover, the hero and family dog. In America, Porter was as busy as ever at Edison's New York studio. One day in 1907, a young man walked into the studio and tried to sell Porter a script. Porter didn't buy the script, but the tall, out-of-work actor was hired to play the lead in this film, rescued from an eagle's nest. The film relates the incredible story of a child being kidnapped by an enormous eagle. The actor Porter hired, seen here dangling from a rope, is David Wark Griffith, a man destined to become a great director himself. best adventure films of the time. It is one of cinema's twists of fate that Porter, who invented film narrative, introduced to the movies someone who was destined to transform that very narrative into a powerful art. And such was the pace of progress that Porter eventually fell under Griffith's shadow. For the first 10 years, he had been America's foremost director but he ended his days as a lowly paid office worker. The world of 1910, and one in which a new type of film was launched that revolutionized the industry and created a regular audience. They called it the serial craze. Here, an age in which adventure stories, whether those of H.G. Wells or or Buffalo Bill thrilled many a reader. And newspapers often serialized such yarns, readers having to buy the paper day after day for the whole story. To enterprising filmmakers, the formula seemed struck. Why not, some thought, transform the written serials to the screen? And so they did. It all began in France and was the brainchild of director Victorin Jassé, 
who shook the trade press with his adventure serial, Zigoma. Zigoma on the left there is an arch villain. And all the serials feature the constant battle of wits between him and Siote chief, Paul Broquet. Here, a bizarre combination of farce and melodramatics. Yet all this failed to amuse some. Jasse had two of his later films banned. The French police thinking little of seeing the anarchistic Zygoma constantly getting away with it. Across the Atlantic, the craze was also gathering steam. But here, a difference. For the heroes had turned into heroines. The first great American success was Mary Fuller, who starred in the What Happened to Mary serials. They began life in 1912 and were followed a year later by the Hazards of Helen, which featured Helen Holmes an expert at grappling with hurtling locomotives. Here a sequence from Helen's sacrifice. Helen works for the railroad as a night operator. A nice sounding job for such a fresh faced girl. Her friend and colleague at Lone Point Signal Box has been up all night nursing his sick child. At work, exhausted, he falls asleep, misses an important signal, and lets the train through. Back on duty, Helen soon discovers the error, and now the typical serial suspense builds up. Can she stop the impending collision? I'll give you one guess, and you won't have to come back next week. In 1914, Pearl White made her first Perils of Pauline serial. It was an instant success. And for the next 10 years, this healthy looking actress was one of Hollywood's most potent box office stars. Pearl Pole's people ran the gaudy publicity, and she certainly did. Pearl White cereal contained the maximum of excitement and the minimum of plausibility. And this one-time trapeze artist reigned supreme over all this mayhem. Action was the keynote. Pearl battled through thick and thin. Well, there's just one thing after another. The cereals had titles like the Tragic plunge through air and fire, the deadly turning, the floating coffin, and, and they were so loved that entire families would book their seats weeks in advance for their Saturday afternoon picture going. All this made movie acting a perilous profession, and most top performers did their own stunts.
These were the original cliffhangers, and every episode ended on a note of high tension, calculated to bring the audience back next week. The peak of all this villainy and heroism was the year 1916. Europe was at war, and women brought into factories, shipyards, and frontline hospitals had taken on a different role. For many, the female idols on the screen epitomized this new spirit of womanhood. And the serial heroines played no small part in changing public attitudes toward women's emancipation and rights. From France, during the early war years, came two serials that proved to be immensely popular. The first, made in 1914, featured a comic book hero called Fantomas. Fantomas is a villain who lives in constant disguise and throughout the two-year run of the serials, his identity was never revealed to the cinema public. In this sequence, he goes to a fancy dress ball intent on a jewel robbery. At the ball, however, are the local gendarmerie, hot on Fantomas' tail. Here, Fantomas is in his true mystical element, for, following a tip-off, he dresses himself in the same disguise as his police followers, that of a black-clad, hooded devil. The ensuing action weaves a spider's web of murder and intrigue. But, as usual, after one gendarme mistakenly kills another, Fantomas escapes. Judex, unlike Fantomas, is a do-gooder a solemn precursor to Batman and the Lone Ranger. He lives in the rocky Chateau Rouge, where, with his faithful assistant, he waits to combat any villain. In this sequence, a woman in peril has released some doves. The doves are Judex's call sign to come to her aid. And he gallops off, complete with accompanying hounds, to the rescue. In the next scene, an old man rescues the woman and reunites her with her family. But once alone, this old man reveals himself as Judex. Here, too, another master of disguise. Later, in true gentlemanly fashion, Judex dons his cape and discreetly, mission accomplished, walks off into the night. In Italy, in 1916, their most prominent director, Giovanni Pastroni, made Maciste Alpino. This adventurous wartime romp is based on the Herculean exploits of a genial giant called Maciste. Here, a young lady is in distress, held captive by two wicked generals. Single-handedly, Machiste sets off to rescue her.
Mashisti, I think that's the way you pronounce his name, uh, who, as the story goes, was originally discovered sweating it out in a steel yard, became immensely popular throughout all of Europe. And his kind of comic Tarzan-like exploits, alongside those of um, a more serious nature, like Pearl White and Ruth Rowland and the others, they were the ones who paved the way for the more gracefully athletic heroes of another age. an age when thousands around the world flocked to Nickelodeon parlors, theaters, and picture palaces to witness what was to them a new miracle. For this was the time of the birth of the cinema, the motion picture, the very beginning of the first truly mass entertainment industry. I, I can't <clears throat> really remember anymore the first movie I ever saw, but I do remember vividly the movie that most impressed me when I was a child. It was a serial starring that greatest of all the magicians and escape artists, Harry Houdini. Actually, he was even more famous on the stage and in vaudeville, because I, I can remember seeing him in the old New York Hippodrome, and he'd tie himself up in chains, and they'd put him in a sack and dump him in a tank of water, and somehow he'd get out. But this time, it was in a serial. And week after week, my cousins and I would troop back to the theater to see what magic Houdini would work to get out of that seemingly impossible bind we had left him in the Saturday before. But early in this century, it seems to me, magicians were much more prevalent than they are now. And much more often headliners in show business. They were among the great stars of vaudeville and music halls, the, the popular entertainment that movies and radio and television would eventually replace. But even before those institutions died, magicians were attracted to movies. Well, for one reason, they were very simply a magical medium offering them an infinite variety of opportunities to practice their illusionary art. It was very often former magicians who were the first to experiment with making pictures move. Before the invention of motion pictures, the magic lanternists projected slides onto large screens to the kind of audience that would soon become patrons of the movies. This early 19th century slide of Noah's Ark shows a moving procession. Soon it was possible to transform winter into summer. And day into night. All kinds of movement became possible.
movement could almost bring still pictures to life. This toy is called a zoetrope. When you look through the slit in the side and revolve the drum, a simple strip drawing seemed to come alive. Emile Renault was able to project moving strips by machine to excited audiences in Paris four years before the invention of the cinematograph. His moving drawings were the first cartoons. Another French pioneer, Emile Cole, developed the same principle using the motion picture camera to photograph his line drawings onto film. In 1910, he made The Adventures of Baron de Crac. had sprung to life as cartoons and were often shown in theaters as part of a live performance. The elaborate theater productions of shadow plays could now be replaced by cut-out silhouettes on film. One of the first silhouette filmmakers was William Armstrong from England, who made this beautiful film, The Clown and the Donkey, in 1910, to be shown on the bill at the Palace Variety Theater in London. Windsor McKay, the cartoonist, presented the first American cartoon as part of a vaudeville act in 1909. This was Gertie the Dinosaur. The dinosaur breathed, and its owner actually appeared to feed Gertie on the stage. She was a drawing that had come to life. Thank you. 
Conjuring tricks that used to depend on a magician's skill could now be done on film. Some of the first people to make films were conjurers, and trick films were one of the first film crazes. In Britain alone, many trick films like this were made. The impossible became possible. 